the broadcast is live. <laughs> Let's go. <laughs> Neftali, how are you? I'm good. How are you? Let me let me say that again. Neftali McKenley, how are you? I'm pretty good. How are you? I'm doing great. I'm doing great. It's just a it's an honor to be here. You know, I'm gonna give the people a bit of a, this, the, a bit of a background of who you are. You were born and raised in Toronto, Canada. Raised in Brampton, actually, born in Toronto. Mm -hmm. At 22, traveled to New York City to pursue your dreams. Later on in life, your performer, your portfolio is so big, you got a chance to work with artists like French Montana, ASAP Rocky, and you got a chance to work with some Canadian legends as well. Everybody, welcome. Niftali to the show. Woo! <laughs> We're, we're, we're working on our, 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 that was our the audience. Best intro I think I've ever gotten, so thank you. <laughs> no problem, no problem. I want to make you feel big because you are big. Thank you. No problem. So <laughs> as we get into it, let's let the audience know. What is one act of self-care you did today? Um, I went for a run today. I hit mm. the track and I did, uh, I did 15, 15 laps of track today. 15 laps back to back. That's kind of crazy. <laughs> I'm definitely not at that level yet but I'll soon reach it. <laughs> what inspires you to work out? Just, uh, yeah. Um, it's just a good way to start the day. You know, I try to start my day at 6 a.m. and uh, just hit the track like 7.30 and, you know, it's just, you know, you're like my own, like my new time. Like that. They, say, they say most millionaires wake up at that age. What's your bank account say? <laughs> my, my bank account say? You know what? Honestly, I'm actually doing pretty well with saving my money right now. So I'm good. Amen to that. Amen to that. <laughs> so wake up that early. I'm guessing you sleep a lot, or you sleep. A lot. Mm. Um, the weekends. Uh, the weekends I sleep. I okay. try to sleep in, but I pretty much have an internal clock. It doesn't matter what time I go to sleep. I, I'm pretty much up around that time. Okay. Okay. You know, it, it's a skill that as creatives we all need to have because you know early. They say early bird gets the first worm. I know I'm butchering the quote, <laughs> but I definitely understand the point of waking up early and getting to it. But I know in order for me to get up early, I have to sleep in because I'm the type of person, if I wake up at 6 a.m. to do 15 laps, I'm going to go back to bed till 12. So that's how it works. <laughs> but we're here today to discuss about a bit of your life, a bit of your journey, get some advice from you and just hear about you. So the first question I kind of want to ask you is, when did your love for the film industry begin? Hmm. Uh, you know what? I always was really fascinated with like music videos growing up, and like around twelve years old, like my parents had just gotten like BET, and my dad just saw like our first like big screen TV. Yeah. And the uh, I remember watching the um, Missy Elliott had this uh, video that Hype Williams directed. Hype Williams, that's crazy. And, uh, ever since I saw that video, I was just like, yo, I want to make videos like this and I want to like, to shoot stuff. So yeah, um, I just kind of grew up uh, always wanting to be like, always holding the camera, being behind the camera. Mm -hmm. I was mm -hmm. Okay, so saying BTA, Miss Yell, you did it for you. Yeah, basically. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the, there's no music videos like Missy Elliott. She was so distinct in, in, in her artistry. Like you like when Missy came on, you knew it was her. And another thing that I like about her, she was kinda um a revolutionary, kinda like a Mary J. Blige. Like they did not their fashion is very different than the fashion of other artists, but they didn't care. They did them and they did them to the full. Now I can see where your journey started in terms of like, okay, I wanna do this, but what were the steps and actions you took towards saying, like, I'm going to do it beyond just the dream? How did you make that dream into a reality in a sense? So uh, I actually told my parents growing up that I was going to go to med school and I was planning on going to med school. So my dad was really happy about that. Yeah. Um, but me and my mom were talking one day and she's like, do you really want to go to med school? And she kind of actually was the one that, like, got it out of me that I actually wanted to go into film. Mm -hmm. um, so when I told her that I wanted to go into film school, she uh, it made more sense to her, and she was like way more supportive of me going into the arts. Mm -hmm. So I mean, we had to hide it from my dad for a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> did you did you choose med school because it looked like the more professional thing to do? Um, I think at that time or that age, it was just kind of like uh, I was really good at, in science, and I was just kind of like if I wanted to be a doctor, I was going to 
I wanted to be a plastic surgeon. Um, and then, uh, but that was just kind of like, what's the, the thing to go to school for? You know, it was either that or I, I knew I didn't want to do law. I actually really enjoy science. So that ah. made sense. Um, but, uh, but I love film and art, so that's my passion. So that's what I pursued. Yeah, we're, thank we're thankful for your mother because not all the time do <laughs> mothers reroute their sons towards the direction that seems less promising, right? Because hearing my son's going to be in the medical field is sounding like money, but hearing my son's going to pursue his dream, it sounds like hope and struggle. <laughs> so, but honestly, we think big up all the parents who support their children and what they want to do. So with your mother's support, how then did you say, okay, like I have this dream to break into the film industry. What were the actions that you took forward? This is also something that other young um, young black kids can listen to as well and see like, what is it, what is it that I need to do in order to launch and start? Mm -hmm. um, I mean, so I grew up in Brampton. <laughs> um, yeah. it was like, you know, like there, I wasn't like chilling on the road in that, in that nighttime, like I was home most of the mm -hmm. time. Um, and I used to just kind of like, around those times you had like MySpace and like Whoa. all these, all these throwback. new, yeah, throwbacks. So like back, like my generation, like we grew up with all these like emerging technologies, right? So yeah. we had the, the MySpace and all that stuff before Facebook. And then I just actually started connecting with people. And yeah. uh, at a college after I finished film school, I was very fortunate. I got a job at like this. Uh, uh, media they called them online magazines mm. <laughs> when they first launched but they just like these websites mm. uh, yeah i worked at a fashion website here in the city um and then it kind of like i was just doing video editing and shooting there yeah um, but then i just decided to like start taking that side of my career further like in content creation i kind of saw like the opportunity to just pursue it more independently than kind of um following the rules to get into the industry you know so yeah that's kind of how i pursued it so in a sense i'm hearing a lot of networking yes lots of networking that's what i meant to say i got you, I got you. So, <laughs> it's all good it's all good so in a sense where if you're if you're someone who wants to be behind the camera connect with artists connect with people who do things in front of the camera to see if you yeah. either want to capture them now of course, in the beginning, I don't know how it's for you, but in the beginning for me, when I took on opportunities, they weren't paid opportunities. I had to do a lot of free stuff before I can get paid for stuff. Is that kind of the route you went where you had to do a lot of free work for artists or bloggers and then later on was able to kind of get your bag into it? How did you get to the point where you're saying this is becoming a business because I'm getting a check for this work? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, for me, it was just kind of like... Uh, a lot of stuff I did for free in the very beginning, um, but that's because I was really passionate about my dream. Yeah. Um, and I kind of knew like what my portfolio needed to look like in order for people to really take me seriously. Yeah. Um, so I just kind of started volunteering and, you know, people would be giving me all these jobs and all this content and like I have all these like uh really important people in my portfolio early on in my career which kind of led to like bigger opportunities yeah. and to be honest the magazine that i was working on in toronto for free um was the magazine that actually brought me out to brought me out to new york city and that's how my career started out there so working wow. for free kind of launched my career wow you know there's a there's there's a lot of um stigma around free work <laughs> you know of course no artist wants to sign up to do things for free but i think in the beginning when you're trying to build a resume you got to get some experience in and mm -hmm. it's better to mess up on free things rather than to mess up on things you were paid for so mm -hmm. to all creatives out there i would just encourage that if you don't have no from a resume go out to an open mic go out to a few things because you never know the things that you do for free there might be someone somebody in the audience who's going to give you a, a gig that's going to get you paid but all together, we all need experience, right? So what would you say to the artist who's struggling to make a business out of what he's doing or she's doing? Um, hmm. 
I mean, for me, it's just kind of like, uh, you know, you have to kind of just examine your brand and how you kind of approach things really. Yeah. Um, is it, you know, do you need to take more classes and kind of stepping your quality up? Yeah. And do you need to study editorial more? Um, are you networking in the right circles? You know, mm -hmm. and it's just kind of like a lot of people kind of network within their network to make money, but, you know, are you networking with the people who are going to pay you guys stuff? Yeah, um, uh, it, it's it's a lot of kind of like you have to kind of hustle for a while before you start making clientele. But you also for real. Kind of, you got to kind of make sure that you stand out too, right? Like it's mm. all about like how you carry yourself as a person, but also kind of like how does your work look and why? Should, like you have to give people a reason to want to hire you over the other person, right? Yeah, yeah. So yeah. standing out is definitely a huge part of that. So I'm hearing a lot of networking and but the biggest thing that a lot of us fail to do is planning because if you don't plan you plan to fail and a lot of the times we have all these incredible talents but there's no map out plan there's just like okay i'm gonna shoot my target but you don't even have a a vocal point and a focus yet and a lot of the times we get so disappointed as creatives when we don't reach the audience we want to reach when we don't get the numbers we want to see but a lot of the times it's the failing and planning but this leads to my other question. You planned at 22 to leave Toronto to go to New York to pursue your dream. What gave you the courage to do that? But I know you said the magazine you were working for Freeway paid for it. Right? No, actually, I used to pay for myself to go to New York in the beginning. Go ahead and tell me. <laughs> what at 22 gave you the courage to say, I'm going to go pursue my dreams? And what was that vision? What was that journey like? Me, well, I started traveling to New York when I was like 19. Well, I've, I've been traveling, I've always had family and friends in the States growing yeah. up. So we've always visited over there. Yeah. Um, but I started visiting, like going to New York on my own when I was like 19, 18. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I would take the, the bus across the border. <laughs> uh, That's like 11 hours, eh? It's an 11 hour ride, you know what I mean? But wow. you know, when you're young. Before you even continue, what was going through your mind? throughout that that the, those hours you just get really excited you know what i mean you're about to head out to new york you have your friends who are out there so you're just yeah. kind of on a trip right but yeah um you know i always have my camera with me uh i was always seeing that people that i need to like shoot them and just kind of like hang out make content um a lot of time again when it comes to doing free work and building my portfolio um, for the magazine I used to work out here, I would offer to go shoot New York Fashion Week for them because mm -hmm. I used to like um, get online and hit up PR agencies to get like contact lists for all the designers and stuff. Yeah. And I would email all their PR people and get into all these fashion shows for Fashion Week. Yeah. Um, and so then I would always spend a lot of time just shooting out there behind, behind the scenes and shooting it for the magazine and um, again building that content it was for them i would be publishing in the magazine because it would be as like a platform but also throwing that into my portfolio so it was just kind of like for me it's like i'm going to go out to new york to have fun anyways so yeah. I might, do it might as well shoot some anyway. stuff and see what's up and you're going to fashion week to go party anyways so you want to <laughs> go yeah. just work um and again it's like it's, it's you have to think about all the the benefits of doing that you know you get content for yourself you're networking yeah. and you get to just you know travel and have some fun yeah people don't understand the importance of content building mm -hmm. <laughs> like when you're looking towards making um post on social media or building your resume having a folder of work <laughs> is so essential that you always have something on display or something in the in the back of your bag that you can pull out. And you can also have fun while doing it. Sometimes I struggle though to be physically present in the room when I gotta capture it as well. So sometimes I do go to events without my phone and anything just to like have fun and not feel the need to Instagram or IG things. But a lot of the times if I'm performing, I always knew from a very young age, capture this performance, capture this, capture this, because later on I'm gonna build a lot of these videos and stash them together so when a festival or somebody wants to book me here's what i do and here's my work mm -hmm. but the question i have to ask is was it ever awkward for you to ask to be paid for your work like how did you figure out all right this is my price and i deserve to be paid this amount because i know for a lot of creatives this is a big struggle 
Um, actually, you know, I have the funniest story when I kind of like learned my work. Yeah. <laughs> Keyword, uh, he said, learned my work. Yeah, I mean, you actually have no idea like how much people are willing to like pay you for your work. Wow. Um, and uh, a friend of mine had put me in contact with these guys in, in Toronto actually to um, shoot some like advertisements for their, like this condo development. Yeah. It was like right out of college, like just finishing film school, just starting to work at these magazines and make content. Yeah. And I was in this meeting with like these like a group of like these like rich white guys, um, like the condo developers basically. And so <laughs> I'm just chilling there. I'm like 22 at this time, 21. And uh, they told me what they wanted. And I was just like, cool. So they were asking me what my price was. And I said, um, I could do it for six. Mm -hmm. And in my head, I was thinking 600, but they said, cool, we can do six grand. <laughs> <laughs> and, and it was kind of at that time I realized, I was like, okay. Wow. These guys are willing to pay like big money for that stuff. So. Wow. <laughs> wow. I could only, were you able to hold yourself? Like, were you able to be like. I was shook. I was shook. Like, I was just like. <laughs> but I didn't correct them, you know? I was just kind of like sitting there, just very quiet, and I was like. <laughs> <laughs> Mind you, I called all my friends after of that. Course. Like, you have to help me, you have to help me. I, I'm gonna pay you to shoot this for me. I pulled out all the stops, but like, it was yeah. definitely like a learning lesson. Wow, 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 <laughs> wow. I think I'd lose my mind. I think, <laughs> I think I'd be there like, yeah, that works. Um, um, Damn. Yeah, like I would lose my mind. Like, wow, mm. from six hundred to six thousand, and that goes to show me that, you know, we all have friends, we all have family, and friends and family shouldn't use their relationship with us to pay us less. If you yeah. have a friend, if you have a family that's some that's doing something positive or incredible, pay full price and even pay them more because a lot of the times, as creative, we don't know what we're worth. And sometimes it takes someone to show us and be like, wow, like if they're willing to, like, you know what I mean? Like we don't always have the experience, you know what I mean? So congratulations yeah. to you. I think for me, the first time I got, I never had that type of story. I would lose my head. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody ever offered me 6,000 yet. And I said yet, cause I'm manifesting it will happen. But I remember the first time someone offered me, um, you know, I, the first show I ever got paid for, I got paid 20 bucks. But let me tell you why it would have meant so much to me. It's only because my parents told me, you'll never make any money in music. Mm. Um, so when I ended, you know what's crazy? It was a check for $20. <laughs> <laughs> way, no. back in the, way back in the, I know. It doesn't, <laughs> doesn't make no sense even check turned out. Either way, but when I held that check in my hand, I said, wow, like I'm, it is able to make money from what I love doing. And from that 20, at 15, I later on applied for a grant and I got my first 500 from art. Then at 16, I applied for a grant and I got my first $1,000. So sometimes you start small and go big. I'm just giving people the difference because not everybody's going to start off with 6,000. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's crazy. I actually will say to you, I actually go big and give them a chance to meet me where they can. Yeah. Yeah. I you hear know, you. I, so. But sometimes, sometimes you have to do that, though. Sometimes you have to do that. Yeah, sometimes you have to, but also, also like in regards to like me even getting that six grand, um, yeah. it took a lot of work to like make sure that my portfolio was at a certain place and that uh, I was like delivering content that was at that level. You know? 100%. So it did take a, a lot of like studying and figuring out. It's not all out. in one day. This whole uh, yeah. overnight success story is a, a fantasy. <laughs> it's a lot of work. I mean, yeah. it's definitely. You know, things. there's a lot of things available to people because, you know, we have virtual now. Yeah. Um, but overall, there's like, you know, it does take some time. It does take a craft, I guess, too. No, for sure. It takes 10,000 hours to master a craft. But you're saying the best thing to do is start big and then let them meet you where they can, in a sense. Uh, if I'm negotiating, negotiating things. But sometimes you're just on your flex where you're saying, I just my price and I'm not going to change it. Uh, no, actually, you know what? It depends. It really depends on who it is. Okay. But for the most part, yes, I do have my fixed 
my <laughs> rates. Yeah, but yeah, it's not it's not impossible to work with me. I would say. Do you ever? I ask this question to a creative who does clothes, and they sell their clothes for like three hundred pop. And I ask this creative, "What are your prices for local art for local under for local people coming from underprivileged communities? Because your local person might not be able to afford." something of that high standard. So is that something you ever factor in, like commercial price and prices? I'm getting the vibe that you do in a sense. Yeah, I mean, a lot of the times, even just for like artists and stuff like that, I'll do kind of like pop-up photo shoots if people want headshots and stuff yeah. like that. Yeah. I kind of just do like some like fun, yeah. like little deals and stuff like that. But that's just like community work too, right? Just kind right. of working with people and offering my service however I can. Or, if I have a job, like I definitely like hire a lot of the young people in the city to work on those projects. And that's appreciated because we're artists, you know, like you said, born in Toronto, raised in Brampton. You know what I mean? We're, we're coming from all different communities in the GTA. So it is important that as we rise in our success, that we still look out for and do certain things. And not to the point where we're taking advantage of, but to the point we're doing our duty work and we're doing, we're making sure that our hearts are clean, that we know our talents are getting a chance to intersect all sides of the city and not just the rich white condo people who can give you 6,000 like that. <laughs> <laughs> but yo, with that being said, man, you got a chance to travel um, Toronto, New York, from Canada to America. Now, there's a stigma that racism is only in the States, but you as a black man, how has it been in the film industry in Canada and in America? Mm. The same, any differences? What would you say to that? Uh, um, racism, the difference between. Um, I mean, I think that America is a little bit more, uh, you know, the racism out there is a lot more. Apparent? Apparent. I mean, it's embedded, really. It's, I mean, 400 years of history that slavery kind of, um, you know, impounded into into yeah. the country. Um, so it's very different. I find that the, for here in Toronto specifically, a lot of us um, Canadians who are like Black or just BIPOC overall are first generation. You know, I'm first generation Jamaican. My parents are from Jamaica. I'm Canadian, bop, bop. right? <laughs> um, most of my cousins, I think all like, you know, a lot of my cousins are either Jamaican or first generation Canadian as for my friends. Mm -hmm. So I'll find that like out here, it's not, you know, the history in America is a little bit more different. Um, yeah. You do have African Canadians scattered out across Canada and pockets of the communities out right here. Mm -hmm. uh, because a lot of people don't know that the Underground Railroad led out to Nova Scotia, most some of it. Um, so you do have African Canadians. Um, but the uh, the racism in Canada is like super passive aggressive. <laughs> mm -hmm. I find so that people aren't very straight up here with it. I think that people like smile in your face and are like racist out here. and they're polite with their racism out here. Um, <laughs> polite with racism. <laughs> yeah, polite with racism. I think, you know, uh, a lot of people I find like talk at you and not to you. Yeah. And that's kind of like really weird to me. There, it's, uh, it's, it's a different, it's definitely a different vibe. Um, <clears throat> but for me, like, I've just kind of always dealt with bullying and growing up. So I like have like from a very young age just known how to navigate in white spaces and how to deal with like white people who act a certain way you know what i mean mm -hmm. like i'm not very intimidated by that so mm -hmm. it's, it's not of, new to you it's not new to me and it's just like i'm i just kind of i don't know i just don't really i, I don't know i think that it has something to do with me just like would, would you say you've experienced so much that at this point you're desensitized? I guess so, yeah. I guess that's a good way to, to say it. Or I just don't give people a chance to really come to me with that vibe because mm -hmm. I just keep it very like straight up. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think it takes, I think it's a skill that we grow into to be able to understand that my ears, my, my spirit are very connected. So whatever you're feeding into me has to actually feed 
me life. You know what I mean? Yeah. I'm not I'm not ever in the mood to hear death. You know what I mean? So I think it, but I think at, at first, sometimes we care so much what people have to say. We open our ears to everything. But sometimes it is really important to keep your circle, your circle small like a Cheerio so you can stay cheered up. That's what I always say. <laughs> Having a small, you know, it's all about quality. Not mm. Quality, not quantity. Mm. <laughs> I'm, I'm getting the vibe of a little of a poet out here. <laughs> it's a crazy. You know, overall <laughs> no for sure you know because sometimes people say oh i don't have so many friends but you have one real friend and really that may be all you need and you know it's important to know the difference between a friend friend and just friends associates people you see on a day-to-day and you meet all of them really and truly because it's important to you know we weren't we weren't created as humans to just stay in our own shell it's important for us to communicate and connect and vibe on a level which is why I appreciate you coming on this live today because I know what a lot of the work you do, you play the background role. Now, I don't believe we've touched on this on the live, but we spoke about this before, but what kind of given you the courage to say, all right, I want to represent myself in front of the camera more now as opposed to just playing the background role? Um, <laughs> I mean, for me, it's just kind of like, um, I just moved back home uh, in April last year. Mm -hmm. um, I just started getting into programming. Um, I just got I just got into programming this this last year in January, and um, I'm seeing the community out here. I'm seeing the work that needs to be done, especially with our young creatives. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I mean, I'm just down to kind of like influence and help people as much as possible, and give some advice. And yeah, you know, usually I wouldn't do this type of stuff, but um, yeah. You know, I just kind of like at this time, especially during like pandemic and having everyone mm -hmm. and it's like if somebody if somebody needs to like, take away something from this, I'm happy to like provide that, I guess. Beyond <laughs> we appreciate she appreciates that. I appreciate that and another community does as well. But beyond everything you just said, I think what we spoke about before is the importance of having the representation of us on film behind the camera and in front of the camera. And I know you've put on a lot of black people in front of the camera, but you as a black person, we need to see you in front to be able to hear from you, see you, so that the next black person that says, I wanna work behind the camera is like, wow, it's possible. If he could do it, then I can do it. So I accommodate you, I appreciate you. And all together, was you putting black people in front of the camera, cause that's revolutionary in a sense, right? Because the reality of it is we're not, they don't, we're the last booked. And if we are booked, we're not booked for things that are the most positive. But I got a chance to get a bit of your film, your new film, which is if I, they, they come, they go, mm, correct? Yeah, so that film yeah. was actually directed by my really good friend. I designed and edited that whole film. Got you, got you. So, got you. Uh, yes, he is the writer, director, and I am the designer. Uh, okay. But when it comes to putting black people in front of uh, front of the camera, there's definitely a huge conversation behind that. Before yes, happens, you know? let's do it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Get into it. <laughs> you know, okay. Well, I mean, like for this piece, um, they come, they go. Uh, it's um, a 14 minute short film. Um, my friend Cameron J. Ross, who is an amazing actor who's on BET's Boomerang. Um, and he is also a writer with Gersh in LA. Yeah. Um, he uh, wrote this amazing piece. Um, and it was just a visual, visual film um, that he wanted to depict Black love in this very like modern, mm -hmm. but um, very like just kind of like a, um, a tribute to old film. Yeah. Um, and because he, the reason why he wanted to do it in that style was because back in the day, black people weren't really shot on film. And there was only wow. really a few, very, very few films that actually showed like black people on film or like in love or in positive images on film. Yeah. Um, and I mean, the conversation gets very deep in the sense that film was built in a way so that it couldn't really document black skin. Wow. 
So there's just kind of like this whole like story behind wanting to create this black and white film with black actors and making sure that we had the lighting right and making sure that yeah. the was right and the color yeah. correction was right. So there was just this whole process of, you know, ex executing something that was very like, it's a modern twist on, you know, something that we don't have much documentation of in the past. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm thankful you're doing that work to put us in front of the camera and make sure we look good and yeah. make sure that we have roles that are honorable. Um, because a lot of the times, my experience with seeing the bit of the film that I got to see is, though you didn't direct it, I, I, I love the, the visual effect of it. And beyond that, I just love the fact that we're represented it on camera and I'm able to see us on screen because so many times when you log into these platforms like Netflix and Amazon Prime and a lot of these platforms, sometimes you kind of struggle to find black films. And we are on Amazon Amazon Prime, by the way. So you I know, I've seen that. that. I've seen, <laughs> I've seen that. You can but look I'm, the film up on there for sure. And I just want to see more of us on these platforms. You know what I mean? I want to see more of us on these platforms. And, um, and I'm glad to know somebody who is a part of these platforms. So with that being said, like you said, putting black people in front of the screen is a revolutionary act because it's something that hasn't been done before. Now, what type of artists have you put in front of the screen? Is it musical artists? Is it actors? Is it photographers? Like, what have been your experiences with putting black people in front of the camera? Wow, okay. I mean, um, I've kind of done everything, really, when it comes to, like... Feel uh, free to say small names <laughs> and big names. Well, we're all big, but you know what? Oh man, big global. names! Oh my god, local, uh, local and global. Oh my goodness. Um, I don't know music. I've done like a whole bunch of music stuff. I've shot with like French Montana. Oh, By oh, the oh, way, oh oh oh, you said huh? who? You said who? Wait, who do you want? You want to know all the celebrities that I've worked with? Or hey, who I said you? I said local and global. You started out local. big with French Montana. <laughs> Hard in my French. That sounds like wow. a <laughs> um what's it called? The uh local artist. You know, I've been gone for a while, so I've been like I've missed like about 10 years of my life in Toronto. So I haven't really shot too many people out here, which I'm looking to change very soon. But well, I've worked well, if you want to make me your first, I'm not mad at all. You know what I mean? No problem. <laughs> we can make that happen. That's the, uh, the, uh, I've shot uh, a few people. Like I've shot Keys and Crates. Um, I shot uh, Carly Rae Jepsen, and she kind of blew up. Um, Light. Who is another like Canadian pop star? Yeah. Um, the Airplane Boys when they were doing really big. Um, those were like the early years of when I was in Toronto, um, and then internationally, um, I was just shot for like a lot of like fashion brands. Um, uh, Kevin Durant sneaker, Corona boxing, um, Asap Rocky, French Montana. French Montana, who is by far like the nicest person to ever work with. That's so. Um, and uh, who else? Uh, Big Sean. Um, yeah. Give me, give me, give me one second. Yeah. Yes. Give me one second. So now I'm on. Now I'm on camera by myself. And uh, okay, I see a question. I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask, I'm gonna answer the question since I'm by myself. Uh, when you look at where you are now and where you came from, what do you think are the main reasons for your success? Um, uh, I think definitely my parents were a huge support. I mean, shout out to my dad and my mom for like sending me money. <laughs> that was huge. Oh, you have your kids. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She just came in. Just, nice. Yeah. I read the question here, so I'm just answering it. What's popping? Um, they want to know uh, when you look at where you are now and where you came from. What do you think the main reason for your success is? Yes. 
Yeah, so I was saying my parents, definitely. Um, I remember like being in New York, my parents would send me money or they would just kind of just like help me out big time, just kind of making sure I was really good. So shout outs to them. Um, and honestly, like just keeping myself around people who had the same hustle as me. Yeah. Um, my friends were really big on like, you know, with having such amazing support system from my parents, my friends really kept me going because we were working on our goals together. Um, and I found that like when I moved to New York, I didn't move to New York by myself. You know, like I had a whole team of people. I was fortunate to move out there. But I also just made sure I did the networking that I needed to do. How? how um, and just really loving Oh, shoot, my cousin's my cousin's in here. That's my cousin Jeffrey. Hey, what up, Jeffrey? <laughs> now you said you guys, you and your mom had to hide it a bit from your dad for a while. When did your dad go to accept that my son is in the film industry and that's dope? <laughs> um, I think it took him a while. I mean, I don't know how he really just. I don't know when he got over it. You know, like you know how Jamaican dads are, right? Or, like, dads, they like. They're just very like strong, silent type, you know. He more so would, if anything, he would probably talk to my mom about it. But he, um, I mean, he uh, had one one conversation about it, and that was it. Um, but my dad, uh, he was, uh, he. I think that he's very proud now. You know, what I mean, he's very much like completely. If you ask my dad what I do, he's not really sure. He thinks I think he's, I think he's still <laughs> working fashion. I don't know. He's just very happy to see that I'm like working. I think that's all he really cares about. He only, he only <laughs> cares to make sure you're working, yeah. You're working and I'm doing a good job at it. <laughs> Give me a second, yeah. Okay. Um well it's a blessing to finally have well I get what you mean though. I get what you mean. He he basically just has accepted it in the fashion but it's like yeah he does the he does the film thing and he, he does the <laughs> yeah i get what you mean i get what you mean i get what you mean our mothers are the ones who are more so invested our dads just want to make sure we're working in a sense i get it i get what yeah. you mean but I, I remember i was explaining to you earlier before that i go by a certain slogan entitled support local before global so how did you go from a local creative to a global creative Wow. Um, <laughs> I mean, from local to global, you know what I mean? Uh, one thing I want you guys to know is like, you can really just like achieve things like if you just are very consistent. Yeah. Um, consistency will be like, will help you achieve almost anything. And I think that my biggest thing has just been staying consistent and like showing up for myself every day and making sure that every time like all the time i really invest in is into my career yeah yeah um and so you're saying just invest into your craft plan network mm -hmm. and make sure you're surrounded around the right kind of people by that do you mean friends do you mean family just like in general to make sure that your mental health is at the best space you can possibly be yeah no 100 percent. like it's definitely that but i also just mean more so in like delivery like making the work and getting the work out there and yeah you know if anything it's more of like getting the work done it's you know hustling and you know that's the biggest part is like what does your portfolio look like like what kind of connections do you who have you worked with and who have you worked with, with? like those types of things and staying consistent on top of that. Like you could mm. do as much networking as you want, but like networking is just like networking. Like you have to work, like get the work done and do as much as you want to. My advice, one thing that I would say to like young creatives in order to like, if you're like, how do I get this type of work and how do I like make that happen? Is like, find yourself a mentor. Like, mm. Mentor you in the city, like, Hit up your favorite designers, your editors, your anyone in film. Like, hit them up. Just hit them in the DM. Hit them with an email. Uh, what about the person who's too afraid and says, "Oh, they have too many followers. I don't know if I should message them." 
I mean, I've hit up a lot of really amazing people who have actually gotten back to me. And I don't necessarily hit people up in their DMs. I always find the email or find a way to email them. Um, they're trying to get attention better. All right, yeah, the microphone, the microphone kind of chipped out here. Yeah, I can hear you. Okay, I kind of chipped out for a sec. So you said you normally try to get their like numbers and stuff? Uh, I would just find like their emails or, and stuff. Like if you go to like, uh, for example, like if I go to a director or a photographer's personal website, if you go to the contact section, you're bound to find an email. Or if there's like a little submission box, like write something in that box, you know? Um, okay. Or, yeah, just like hit people up. I've, I've I, guess, I guess that'd be more professional in a sense. Hmm? Yeah. I guess. It, I mean, yeah. feel free to hit people up in their DM. You know what I mean? And th yeah. that's still cool too. I mean, if someone hits me up in my DM, I'm gonna check it, right? So. True, 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 true. But what is the best way to contact someone? Is it through email? Um, I would say email. Email. Okay. okay. But that's just me. I don't really, I don't really chill on social media, so I don't really I've check. I've noticed. My... I've noticed. <laughs> I don't really that's check another... my. I don't, that's another question I have. Like, to break into the film industry, do you have to be social media savvy, or do you just have a, have a team who knows how to be social media savvy? Like, how how does that? Yeah, I guess it kind of matters on what you want to do in social media. Um, mm -hmm. As a content creator, um, I wouldn't say that I'm social media savvy. I just kind of like have an aesthetic. Like, I know what I like and what my taste is, and I kind of like design within that element. But when it comes to like pushing social media, I don't really know the analytic aspect of things, you know? Mm -hmm. So it kind of just really matters. When it comes to film, I mean, like being an artist is like, it kind of just really matters. Like for me, I've, I'm more focused on the visual arts aspects of digital media. So I don't really, I don't really have to be, um, like on social media too much because I'm not really looking to like gain an audience, you know? Yeah. What I mean? yeah. It's kind of looking, it's just like to keep in touch with people or to follow like accounts of other things that I like. Like I like memes. I follow a lot <laughs> of meme accounts and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, so that's kind of what I use social media for. I hear you. Well, we're coming, we're coming close in here towards the end of our, of our chat. It's been well. Hope you've been enjoying yourself. But Thank you. uh, a few things I wanted to say. Um, what would you say is the move in your career that you're the most happy you accomplished? Like out of everything you've done, that one thing that I said, wow, like, no, I'll flip the question. What are you the most proud that you've done? And the moment that you're like, I'm actually impacting society in a very positive fashion. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, spending 10 years in New York City was pretty amazing. You know what I mean? And a lot of the young people that I talk to right now, I always encourage them to, if you're in your 20s, go have fun and like travel if you can. Um, uh, one thing that Canadians, some Canadians don't know mm -hmm. um, is that you can be in America up to six months without a visa. You just can't work. Mm -hmm. so when I was younger, I would spend like six months out of the year in New York and just kind of hang out um, and not work. <laughs> <laughs> Freelance. <laughs> so I would um, just go hang out out there. So I mean, if you're a creative that wants to just have some fun and stuff like that, like do it while you're in your 20s. I was pretty, I'm really happy I got, I had a chance to do that. Um, and when did you know you were impacting society in an incredible fashion, like a testimony maybe? A testimony. Um, so, yeah, whatever. you know, it's pretty crazy. Um, I was very blessed to join the team over at POV, um, which is another ah. region. Yes. Yeah. Um, so I am over at POV curating and creating all the fun, like the uh, programming and stuff over there right now. Um, and I think that um, I never expected to really enjoy programming this much. And um, just to kind of see how impactful it is and 
how it's really been helping a lot of young creatives kind of up their game or like just kind of, you know, inspire them a bit really is, is pretty fulfilling. So that's kind of like one thing I'm really excited about doing now that I'm home. It's like focusing on the community. On that note, we actually have a collaboration <laughs> between POV and C. Mm -hmm. And I want to kind of touch on that right now. So we have on a, so to everybody who's listening to this, who's interested in being behind the camera and breaking into the film industry, C actually has a production assistant program. I'll give you guys a quick blur. Um, the PA program is a career navigation and development program that supports Black youth with barriers to education and employment. The program will operate for a period of three months. Members will attend classes three days per week, five weeks. This is followed af after. This is followed by eight week placement. Um, the goal of the program is to provide opportunities to gain industry specific skills, pr professional development, transferable skills, build experience, networks all the tools that you will need to kind of break into the film industry. So if that's not something you're interested in, definitely um, go on to our website on c.org and apply. And, you know, maybe you, you get to, then you get there, you know, maybe we set something up for you where you can work with Natalie. <laughs> yeah, no, definitely. I'll be involved with the PA program. Um, I think it's starting in early October. Yep, wow. yep, yep, yep. So you guys can definitely head over to C's website and sign up for it over there. No, for sure, for sure. It's definitely important. Um, is there anything that we didn't mention that you want to mention before we log off? Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> not, not that I can think of. Um, I think that's it. That's good, that's good. How do you feel about being more on camera? Is that, how was this experience for you? You know, got to get used to it. Got to get something used to it? I, something that I got to get used to. <laughs> so you, how, how did you feel about it today, though? Today was good. You were you were very, uh, very entertaining. You're a great host. Thank you. I try my best. <laughs> I try my best. Um, do you care to mention any social media people can follow you on? Ah, um, pick up the film. Pick up the film. Pick up the film. Yes, uh, if you guys want to learn more about They Come, They Go, the Instagram is at They Come, They Go Film. Mm -hmm. um, if you want to follow me on social media, that's at Naftali Online, and I am launching some fun projects towards the end of the month. Oh. I think, are we still live?